This year during Lent, Joe and I are preaching a sermon series called Famous Last Words. We're looking at the seven last sayings of Christ from the cross. This is always the fourth word from the cross, Mark chapter 15. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three o'clock in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out in a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a stick and offered it to him saying, wait, let's see if Elijah will come and take him down. And then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way Jesus breathed his last, the centurion said, truly this man was the Son of God. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> So for the last 1,800 years, the Christian church has taught that Jesus verbalized seven discreet sayings while he was dying on the cross, but in order to get to that shapely, satisfying, sacred seven, the church has had to plunder all four Gospels. I've put a little graph in your bulletins about where the words come from. Luke gives us three of the seven last words. John gives us three also, but they're a different three. None of, there's no overlap between Luke and John, Mark and Matthew give us one each, and it's the same word. So Luke doesn't agree with John, and Luke and John don't agree with the Mark-Matthew tradition. And so in Luke, Jesus dies forgiving his enemies and welcoming a thief into paradise and in the end handing his soul calmly over to his God. And in John, Jesus dies caring for his mother and his best friend, and then at the last instant, he lets out a loud cry of victory, mission accomplished, he says. But in Mark, Jesus dies broken, shattered, and despairing. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, he says. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken, which means to leave in the lurch to run out on, to be the hell and gone, because hell is where the cross is. Hell is just where Jesus is. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. They are among the only words recorded for us in Aramaic, the language Jesus actually spoke every day of his life. And one author suggested that those ugly Aramaic words have survived for 1,900 years because once you'd heard them, you could never unhear them. And if you'd heard them, you tried often and hard to unhear them because they were unforgettable. The fourth word from the cross is often called the cry of dereliction. It's not a word we use every day, dereliction, but when we do use it, we're usually thinking of the homeless guy who pushes a shopping cart full of cardboard and empty Coke bottles under the viaduct on Lakeshore Drive. Because a derelict is a person who's been abandoned. Or maybe we're thinking of an abandoned warehouse, a building, a derelict building that's crumbling before your very eyes, something that's been neglected or abandoned, utterly alone in this world. So you see, here's the thing about Jesus of Nazareth, right? You either got him or you didn't. And those who got him were the little people with almost nothing to lose because he'd lift them, lifted them up to a dignity they'd never known before. They adored him. And the ones who didn't get him were those with a lot of power and status and a lot to lose. Or maybe they did get him and they understood the implications of his eccentric disregard for power and caste and status and pyramid-shaped flowcharts. And so they concocted this unholy conspiracy of temple and empire 
and mobilized this implacable engine of corruptible entitlement so that they could get rid of him, get him out of their world. And so if you want to live into this experience of Jesus' dereliction, this Lenten season, a little more deeply, can I recommend a gospel-shaped parable for you? Who's seen this film called The Shape of Water? Yeah. So 2017 has been a remarkable year in cinema. There is going to be an embarrassment of riches in the Best Picture category this evening at the Academy Awards. And you might have your own favorite, but I'm a person who's always looking for gospel-shaped stories. And for someone like that, it's hard to beat the shape of water. For those of you who've seen it, you know that it's about Eliza, a mute janitor who works in a military lab in Baltimore in 1962. Michael Shannon has a great time hamming it up as Richard Strickland, the lab's sadistic security director who is traumatized by his own war experiences, and this makes him impossible to live with for his family and for his employees. So clearly the director, Guillermo del Toro, means for him to be a symbol for all that is mean and brutal among our own leadership to the present day. And at this military lab, of course, they're studying, actually torturing would be an apter word, they're studying this alien amphibious creature discovered in the mud of the Amazon River, he has webs and fins, but he walks on two feet and he's clearly intelligent. He doesn't speak English. He looks like the creature from the Black Lagoon. And Eliza the janitor speaks sign language. She is so lonely it hurts to look at her. Her only friend is the unemployed gay man who lives next door, and he's obviously just as disenfranchised in Baltimore in 1962. Unaccountably, Eliza the mute janitor falls in love with the creature from the Black Lagoon, and when her friends ask her how she could fall in love with such an alien creature, she says, he's just like me. He can't speak either. He doesn't know what's missing about me. He doesn't know that I'm incomplete. So this creature from the Black Lagoon has many Christ-like characteristics. He can heal you with, your with his touch. In his native Amazon, he's worshipped as a god. But here in this alien land where he's been dropped into, he is persecuted. He's a derelict. There's one more way that he's like Jesus, but I can't tell you what that is because I'll spoil the story for you. But mostly, he's like Jesus because he doesn't notice what's missing about us. He doesn't notice that we are all incomplete. In fact, if you're imperfect and incomplete, he loves you more because there's no one else who will love you. And this makes him dangerous to those with lots of power and status and they have to get rid of him. And so one scholar talked about the crescendo of abandonment that is especially prominent in the Gospel of Mark. I love that phrase, the crescendo of abandonment. We could change the metaphor and talk about an avalanche of malice. And so in that upper room on Thursday night at the Last Supper, Judas betrays him in the Garden of Gethsemane. His friends fall asleep on him, and when they do wake up from their nap, they flee in panic. In the courtyard, Peter betrays him. In the praetorium, Pilate convicts him. In the prison, the soldiers flog him and crown him with thorns. On the cross, common citizens and thieves alike mock him and wag their heads at him in disgust. And in this gospel, there's no good thief asking for a friendship with Jesus. And Jesus doesn't die caring for his mother and his best friend. And he doesn't die victorious. He is utterly, completely absolutely alone and then the cruelest blow of them all even God is gone his best friend literally his soulmate the one he's committed every day of his entire existence to God is gone and he feels forsaken and abandoned my God my God why have you left me holding the bag holding the world when I can barely hold up my own head it's a crescendo of abandonment. So why does Mark leave us with this story, this sad, grim story? Why does he tell us this story 
of Jesus' abandonment. Why does he leave out all those other six words, which are much more pleasant to hear? One answer to that question, of course, is Mark might not have known about those other six words. In the corner of the empire where Mark lived and wrote and worked, this is maybe the story they told about Jesus' death. In other corners of the empire, other churches, other congregations that pass stories from mouth to ear would tell about the other six words. So maybe Mark didn't know about them. But even if he did, I think what's important, I think the reason Mark tells us this one word of Jesus from the cross is because this, for Mark, is the crucial word. Crucial, which comes from crux, which is Latin for cross. This is the one thing Mark wants us to hear because this gospel has been aiming for this very moment since the very first page. Jesus' whole existence in this gospel has been focused like a laser beam just here. This is where we finally figure out why he came to us, why he lived with us, why he taught us, and why he died for us. Because in this word, we discover that Jesus is expressing God's solidarity with all of suffering humanity. Someone put it like this, the abandonment of Christ on the cross is God's response to the scandal of human suffering, of the death of the innocent, of the anxiety of the creature, of all of the whys that have no answer. God's definitive yes to fallen, estranged humanity. In his abandonment, says this scholar, in his abandonment, Jesus becomes God for those who have no God. Jesus becomes God for the godless. Jesus becomes God for those for whom God is gone. So I think Jürgen Moltmann is one of the two greatest living theologians. The other is Hans Kuhn. They're both German. For some reason, the English-speaking world can lead in every other discipline, science, cinema, art, literature, but we just can't catch up with the, the Germans. They're always ahead of us in theology. So... Jürgen Moltmann, 91 years old, professor emeritus at the University of Tübingen in Germany. He came of age in Hitler's Germany. Never been to church before he was 20 years old. Never heard a sermon. But in, during World War II, he served as an anti-aircraft gunner in his native Hamburg. And uh, this was during a time when the Royal Air Force was unleashing a firestorm called, get this, Operation Gomorra. Completely destroyed the eastern half of the city of Hamburg, an entire conflagration. Dr. Moltmann remembers a friend standing next to him in the gunnery that was torn apart by a bomb that left him unscathed. And for the first time in his life, he asked, my God, where are you? And then when the war was over, a lot of these German soldiers ended up in allied concentration camps. And Dr. Moltmann ended up in a camp in Scotland. And the chaplain at this Scottish POW camp handed him a Bible towards which he was indifferent. He didn't want a Bible. He would rather have had a couple of cigarettes, he said. But he started paging through this Bible indifferently and happened upon the story of Jesus' passion. And he says, when I read about Jesus' death cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I knew with certainty that this is someone who understands me. I began to understand the assailed Christ because I felt that he understood me. This was the divine brother in distress, the one who takes the prisoners with him on the way to resurrection. And so that's why Mark wants us to hear just this word from this cross because in this moment, Jesus becomes God for those of us for whom God is gone. And so that when the sun hides its face in eclipse and darkness falls over our whole world, and when the earth shakes and the mountains fall into the sea, when enemies tell lies about us and strangers mock us and our friends betray us and abandon us, when health declines or memory fails or we receive a dire diagnosis, all of this, all of our personal calvaries are gathered up into the vast and lavish love of the Father who will bear us up beyond the last day and well into eternity.
In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.